Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks so much for streaming with us here on ABC News Live. Cruising toward contempt as House leaders decide Steve Bannon's fate today. The former White House advisor facing a criminal contempt of Congress vote after refusing to cooperate in the probe of the January 6th Capitol riot. If found liable, Bannon could face a fine and up to 12 months in jail. We'll bring that vote to you live. The FDA significantly expanding efforts to provide booster shots to vulnerable Americans. Tens of millions of recipients of Moderna's coronavirus vaccines and Johnson & Johnson's single-dose shot are now authorized to receive a booster as we still await an FDA decision on vaccines for children 5 to 11. The Biden administration rolling out a multi-intel agency report on climate change addressing what many people consider the single most critical threat humanity faces today. And new developments in the search for Brian Laundrie, the only person of interest in the Gabby Petito homicide case. Federal agents have found what are possibly human remains as a medical examiner tries to officially identify them. And don't cry but you may have to toss out some of your onions. The CDC issuing a safety alert linking some fresh whole onions to a growing salmonella outbreak in 37 different states. The affected red, white, and yellow onions imported from Chihuahua, Mexico, selling at grocery stores across the nation. But we begin with the NFL reaching a deal to end the use of race norming in the NFL's concussion settlement program. Critics say the controversial system costs some black former players with head injuries millions of dollars. Janae Norman has more on the story. The NFL reaching a deal with its former players, eliminating the use of the controversial practice of race norming, a tool used to evaluate cognitive damage that critics say disadvantaged black former players seeking compensation for head injuries suffered on the field. This battle for us is very personal because this is our, this is our family. You know, these are our families on the line. These are our husbands. These are our fathers. The original settlement program's recommended formula assumed black players began their careers at a lower cognitive level than white players, meaning black players had to prove a more significant cognitive decline than white players in order to receive a payout. But after months of confidential negotiations ordered by a federal judge, new terms were filed to the court under seal on Wednesday. ABC News obtained the 46-page document and learned that the NFL and other parties agreed that no race norms or race demographic estimates, whether black or white, shall be used in the settlement program going forward. Sources familiar with the agreement telling ABC News that the new deal could result in hundreds of millions of dollars in additional compensation for former players and their families. One of those players is Keevan Henry. Football doesn't give you an expiration date. You just expire. I've had 10 concussions or more. I've had at least 17 surgeries, 17, and I've, I'm, I'm still getting them. The former Pittsburgh Steeler defensive lineman submitted a claim in 2017 after he was diagnosed with mild dementia. The settlement administrator denied his claim, citing inappropriate norms used to measure his cognitive decline. I just want to be looked at the same way as a white guy. The NFL initially defended the program, but earlier this year, the league changed course after an ABC News investigation uncovered emails between clinicians who evaluated former players for the program, saying they felt pressured to apply race-based adjustments to players' cognitive test scores and believed those adjustments discriminated against black players. Overnight, the NFL issuing a statement reading, we look forward to the court's prompt approval of the agreement, which provides for a race-neutral evaluation process that will ensure diagnostic accuracy and fairness in the concussion settlement. The agreement will still need to be reviewed by a judge and is also expected to undergo a public hearing before its final approval. But the lawyer for the players in the settlement saying these changes accomplish what we promised to, to eliminate the consideration of race in all the settlement's diagnostic testing and provide black former players retesting or rescoring of claims. Kira. Janae Norman, thank you so much for context there. Now for more, I'm joined by Lacey and Lewis Leonard, who actually saw in that report. The Leonards have been very outspoken on this issue for some time now, especially after Lewis filed a claim with the NFL, only to have it reversed. Lacey Leonard is founder and president of Tackle Health 
and Lewis is, of course, the former NFL player for six teams over five seasons as a defensive tackle. Thank you both for being with me today. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you so much for having us. Thank you. It's a uh, it's, it's my honor and it's an important story to talk about. Lewis, I, I have to start with you. Um, how have you been feeling? Because I know you have been very open talking about dealing with memory, memory loss, a lot of anger, depression. Tell us just how you've been feeling and moving forward. Um, well, it's sad to say um, it don't seem that my, my issues are easing up. Um, tell you, the last two months probably been um, the hardest that I had this year. Um, but you know, my family keep me keep me going. Uh, my wife keeps me motivated. My boys keeps me motivated. But um, tell you the truth, uh, it haven't it, ha it hasn't been the best. It hasn't been the best. So I just try to keep on going. Well, you are blessed to have your family and a family that loves you. And Lacey, you know, look, we know behind every man, there is a strong woman trying to keep things together. How, what have you witnessed, um, you know, with your husband and, and how have you been trying to help him uh, deal with just with everyday struggles? You know, as he mentioned, like these last two months have been very difficult for us, just um, physically and even mentally, Lewis has uh, been struggling. And it's hard, you know, when you have been with someone um, literally your whole adult life and to see their decline physically and then even mentally. And then sometimes I just feel really helpless, you know. Um, the whole month of July, there was many days where Lewis couldn't even get up. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't stand light. So I'd have to keep the room dark or he just, he didn't really want to be around, just very irritable. Um, then physically, you know, there's, days where I have to try to, you know, help him get dressed or just, you know, he, he doesn't, it's, it's hard because when you know where someone was and then you see what they go through on the day to day and then to see, you know, for the last several years, you know, the NFL has been, or they had been de declining players like my husband for their benefits, it, it got discouraging. You know, but for us, we, we have been vocal because we wanted people to really see what it's like. There is life after football. There is life after the NFL. And there are many players like my husband um, who was suffering in silence. Um, you know, we decided to figure out how we can change that narrative, you know, and that's why I wanted to create a place, a safe place for, for guys just like my husband to come and get, you know, the counseling and get the treatment that they need. You know, um, I do think that this is a, a step in the right direction that the NFL is taking, um, but I won't fully be at peace until I see them, um, you know, make it right with my husband. You know, Lewis deserves to receive his claim. The fact that he had received an award and had it denied even after doctors had confirmed his diagnosis, I just, um, you know, my prayer is that the NFL is diligent um, about doing what they are saying they're going to do. So, Well, as you both know, um, an investigation we did here earlier this year uncovered those emails and, and data suggesting that the league's protocols made it more difficult for black former players like you, Leonard, to qualify for compensation. And according to this new 46-page document, it seems like this is an attempt to even the playing field. How were black players not receiving equal treatment. And you can both weigh on this, weigh in on this. Lewis, why don't we start with you? Um, I'm sorry, what was that again? I'm, I'm sorry. That, that's okay. Lacey, why don't, why don't I have you pick up, you know, with, with yeah. and, and Lewis, we'll get back to you. I, I understand, that's a, that's a lot to process. Let's start with you, Lacey. <laughs> so, so basically what they were doing was they were making it more difficult for the black players to be able to receive their benefits because they assumed that neurocognitively that black that black men were slower. So they would have to score higher on the test than say a white former retired NFL player to qualify for their benefits. Now in my husband's particular case, he had received his approval for the NFL concussion settlement. They went through an entire audit and they found no adverse findings in my husband's claim. And right before they were supposed to administer the claim, we received notification that his claim was then overturned. And they said that, oh, well, they didn't account for certain norms. 
including norms with race. So to me, I just can understand how they would deny a player for not allocating for race when race should not determine if there's been any type of neurocognitive damage, if there's any type of brain damage, any type of memory loss. It Race shouldn't be a factor of that. So basically the NFL was strategically placing norms so that black players, former players, would have to score higher than say a white retired player. And that's just not right. And that's what has been happening. That's what's happened to my husband. And that's what we're allocating for. And that's what we're trying to fight for. Lewis, what more do you want to see done? Well, I, I want to see this, um, this finalized. I want to see not only myself, but my brothers who I went to war with um, be able to get some type of restitution and some type of um, um, quality life because you know you you play in the NFL and you're for uh, you're fortunate enough to say hey I'm retired from the NFL but yet you don't feel like it um you know I dealt with injuries from you know I, I had to leave the NFL due to injuries and I've been dealing with this ever since um take it I was dealing with it when I was in the league um when you talk about depression and things of that sort but I just never knew what it was but now that I'm retired and I know that the league is done and to still sit here and think about, you know, what the next 10 or 20 years going to be if I can't get up and do what I need to do to, to provide for my family, it's tough. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, uh, I got two young boys that's growing like weeds and um, sometimes it, 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 it hurts me even more to be broke down and, and in a bed or locked up in a room. Um, and not able to do what I need to do for them. So really, I just hope that um, the NFL and these judges and these lawyers can come up with some type of way to give the players their benefits um, and also uh, allow us to, um, to uh, receive the funds that, that, that we have went to war for and actually be able to uh, give us a chance to live a quality life after being retired. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, sitting right next to you is probably your most fierce quarterback. Every day, Lacey is throwing out a Hail Mary, doing everything she can uh, to help you out. That is clear. You got a family that, that really is, uh, is your, your closest teammates. Lacey, Lewis Leonard, thank you so much for sharing your story. Appreciate it. Oh, very much. We appreciate thank you. you guys. We really thank appreciate you. your having us. God you bless. Bet. God bless. Coming up, victims of domestic violence criticized for speaking out against their abusers. What they did to fight back, all revealed in a new documentary, and we're talking with the directors next. And welcome back to ABC News Live. You know, two directors are shining a light on survivors of abuse. And So I Stayed is an award-winning documentary about three survivors who strikingly have similar stories and were separated by 30 years. They all point to how no one believed their stories about their abuse and each ended up behind bars together to fight back. Here's a clip. We all had police reports, hospital records, witness statements, pictures of violations. For God's sake, Nikki's abuser raped her and, and uploaded it to a porn site. What more evidence do you need? Why didn't my hospital records matter. Why didn't Nikki's hospital records matter? Why didn't Tanisha's hospital records matter? Why didn't my police reports matter? Why didn't Nikki's police reports matter? Why didn't Tanisha's police reports matter? Why didn't my scars, bruises, and marks on me matter? Why didn't Nikki's matter? Why didn't Tanisha's matter? Why does it not matter? What happens to us? Wow. Powerful. What well, matters to us because we're talking about it. Joining me now as we honor Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the film's directors, Natalie Batillo and Daniel, Daniel Nelson, as well as formerly incarcerated survivor and advocate Kim Brown. Thank you all so much for being here. 
Thanks Thank for having, you for having me. me. Natalie, what inspired you to make this film? Well, it, it started out of um, my own experiences of being a survivor of domestic violence. And also um, in 2010, my uh, sister was killed by her abuser. And um, when I went to grad school at Columbia, I knew that I wanted to cover domestic violence. And that was back in 2015. And um, there was a advisor who sort of, I told my personal stories to, to and said, why don't you cover the story about survivors who are criminalized for fighting back? And in my mind, it just like did not make sense that we were putting survivors behind bars for their acts of survival, whether it was self-defense or being coerced to commit a crime by their abuser. Uh, you know, survivors often feel like it's a life or death situation, and it really is. So since then, I uh, decided that I would continue to um, report that. And that's how I, um, I learned about Kim and her incredible work with New York's Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act. I had also um, at that time sent my um, story uh, to Dan, who's co-director, and uh, I'll let him sort of speak to how he came on. And then obviously let Kim speak, on to, speak about her experience <laughs> as well. You got it. I'll guide the conversation. Kim, you know, you were incarcerated for 17 years for killing your abusive husband. Why? What was it? What was it you lacked? What was it that you weren't getting? Who wasn't hearing you that 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 caused you or pushed you to the point where you felt like that was your only option? Well, thank you for having me. and Thank you for having us this morning. Um, I think it's the lack of um, a lack of a an, a trauma informed approach when you bring your abuser to the courtroom. I had five um, arrest warrants for Darnell. I had hospital records, police reports, battered women shelter reports. I had him arrested five times, but none of that seemed to matter at court. And every time we went to court, you know, I was the upset, hysterical woman that no one was really paying attention to. And um, he would stand there and say how I he doesn't want anything to do with me. And then as soon as we would get outside, he would be right there grabbing me by, by the little fat roll on my side, pinching me hard, saying, come on, let's go. So it was um, a lack of support from the system. You, you know, I, I went to the court. I, I filed police reports. I did everything I thought I was supposed to do to be safe and nothing, no one kept me safe. It's just, it's, it's heartbreaking uh, just hearing that. And unfortunately we hear these types of stories far too often. And Daniel, um, my guess is you were pretty surprised uh, to hear uh, many things about these survivors and within Kim's story and, and others. Do you think this doc can make a difference? Do you think this is finally kind of the angle, the feel, the emotion, the characters that can drive home why something has to be done to protect women like Kim? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think when I first started this and, and Natalie had showed me this uh, the story, which was originally Kim's story in a version of her master's thesis, I was really blown away by how prevalent this issue was uh, being criminalized for, for defending yourself against your abuser. Um, and Natalie's an incredible writer and journalist, so the story was incredible. And Kim is one of those people who just sort of jumps off the page when you read about her. And yeah, I feel like documentary film is, is a medium that is very impactful for talking about issues like this. And I just hope that people walk away from this film understanding that um, I, I think folks have a tendency to just trust that the legal system is doing the right thing. Um, and in many cases, it does not, particularly with uh, domestic violence survivors. And so I hope that people can watch that this film and see that. Agreed. And Natalie, you know, the New York Times covered uh, how your film actually played a role in Tanisha Davis's case. She's featured in the film, which resulted in freedom after a conviction. What was that like for you? And does it show you just the power of what your filmmaking can do? 
It really does. It really does uh, show us the power of, you know, storytelling and, and survivors using their voice. Um, we, we were honored to be a part of that process. We worked with Tanisha and her lawyers to put together a video statement with her application to be resentenced under this new law that, you know, Kim had fought for for 10 years. So it was a day that I will never forget. And um, you know, there's still women behind bars like Tanisha. There's Nikki Adamando who faced a 19 to life sentence. So, you know, the work is not done. Um, although that was, you know, very uplifting for us. We, we still hope to, to free more survivors, um, whether it's through educating, uh, you know, the legal system, uh, trainings, uh, you know, uh, and just empathy, like really, truly, it's like these are people's lives. They, they, these survivors had have hopes and dreams. They, you know, are not a true crime story. They should not be reduced to that. And uh, there's real nuance that should be explored in um, learning about domestic violence. And and I hope that our film can contribute to to that conversation. Well, it already has, uh, and you're helping women get their power back. Kim, Natalie, Daniel, thank you so much. And Natalie. Uh, your strength is 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 so amazing. Appreciate all three of you for what you're doing. Thank you for Thanks having, for having us. us. Thank you, you bet. so much. You bet. And you can also go to the website uh, to find out more about the film uh, and why I stayed and watch it. Um, it's powerful. Coming up, a man taking charge of not only his own health, but the health of others in his community. An inspiring Thriver Thursday when we come back. And welcome back. It is Thriver Thursday. You know what that means? Our Robin Roberts spent some time with a pretty amazing man. His name is Aaron Perry. He's one of five global leaders changing the world of health. Because when Aaron was diagnosed uh, with type 1 diabetes, he decided to take charge of his own life while also helping others in his own community. Here's Robin with his story. I knew that the life that I had prior, being very active, I, I wanted to get that life back. I did see this thing called the Ironman Triathlon. My doctor saying, you know, oh, wait a minute, you know, I, I, I want you to exercise. You know, but the Ironman, that's for serious athletes. You, know, you can't do that. 362 days from that conversation, I crossed the finish line of my very first Ironman. Perry is the first insulin-dependent African-American to take part in the Ironman Triathlon. Biggest misconception is that black men don't care about their health. That's not accurate. I would go and get my hair cut, and I would hear guys talk about having all types of health challenges. And then those guys would get that beautiful haircut, and they would walk right out the door. And I realized, you know, there's a disconnect here because these guys are not getting better. I remember asking the owner, and I presented opening up a men's health clinic in his barber shop. There was so much excitement and energy the day that that very first one opened. And when I saw Aaron with just such a big smile on his face, I was just so happy for him because not only has he overcome so much with his own personal health challenges, now he's taken that and he's impacting thousands and thousands of lives. We really have built this full service place where men go. A thriver is someone that doesn't waste a moment and know that something that you do may be the change that that person needed. And thank you for doing what you're doing, Aaron. And Robin, thank you so much for the beautiful story. That does it for us this hour. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks for joining us. Remember, ABC News Live is here for you all day with the latest news, context, and analysis. And I'll see you back here at 3 p.m. Eastern with Terry Moran. Stay safe and have a great rest of your day. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.